Hi, Jean Schnepp here. Welcome to another Savvy Sightseer video vacation. Thank you to everyone who sent such positive feedback about the first Hey Long Island, What's Up With That video, and suggested some interesting items to include in this sequel. Today we will again roam the island and take the time to stop and find out what something is and why it's there. We'll satisfy your curiosity about something you passed on a road, and learn the backstory of some places you might truly be shocked by, and even explore some of the unusual street names you may have encountered. Hey Long Island, what's up with that part two? We'll stop and take a second look at sites, memorials, and curiosities along highways and side streets in more than 20 locations. We'll even span a few centuries. Some of these have been around a long time. Some are brand new additions to the island. This program and the pictures were taken during the summer of 2020 and into 2021. It was another great way to get out and about while still social distancing. Almost all can be seen from the comfort of your car. A few, though, do require a little walkabout, but in some very lovely places. If you are not familiar with some of the town names, you can find a link to an interactive map of the sites in this video on the programs page in my website. The address for that is posted at the end of the video. So, let's hit the road together now for a trip like no other. Before beetles ravaged this grand old tree, it was much like many others in Setauket, on the north shore of Suffolk County. But after the diseased parts were removed, it was destined for a new life. A retired art teacher wielding his chainsaw transformed the unsightly stump into a public display of art, and voila, the Old Town Road tree became the personification of sages, like those found in English folklore. The artist says he enjoys repurposing wood and making something useful and beautiful out of it. Standing in a patch of green on the west side of Route 111 in Manorville, Suffolk County, is this simple obelisk that has ties stretching across the Atlantic Ocean. It commemorates the role a former farmer played in the 1916 Easter Rising, which led to today's Republic of Ireland. One time Manorville resident Thomas Clark is considered an architect of that rebellion. He had first come to the U.S. in 1881 and traveled back and forth across the Atlantic for a few years until he was arrested for his involvement in the Irish nationalist movement. He spent the next 15 years in a British prison after which he fled back to America. By 1907, he had become a naturalized U.S. citizen. He had married and owned 60 acres of farmland in Manaville. But the call of Irish patriotism led him back, and he helped lay the groundwork for the Irish War of Independence from Britain and laid down his life for the cause. He was executed in May of 1916. The 3,000-pound memorial is made of native Wicklow granite, that was quarried, carved, and engraved in Ireland before making the journey to the Clark Farm in Manaville in 1987. Some legends just refuse to die, despite the light of facts, especially when they are cast in bronze. Commanding the intersection of routes 25 and 25A in Suffolk is a monument of Whisper the Bull, who represents an endearing, albeit questionable, centuries-old local legend. The story goes that Richard Smith, or Smythe with a Y, made an arrangement with an Indian chief as a reward for rescuing his kidnapped daughter. The bargain was, Smith would be given all the land he could ride through on the back of his bull in one day. In 1660, a day before the historic ride around, Smith paraded his bull's favorite cow across a 55 square mile stretch of land. An incentive for the bull to pick up her scent and then quickly cover territory to find her. It helped that Smith picked the longest day of the year for this trotabout to get as much territory as possible. Kind of reminds me of the old supermarket competitions where you got to keep everything you could throw into a cart before the timer ran down. The resulting loop of Smith's border marking was then named after him, and the town of Smithtown was established. In fact, it appears the Smithtown Bull legend is a sort of mashup of facts. It was Lion Gardner, the founder of the first British settlement on Long Island, who had acquired the land from Indian Chief Wyandanche for safely returning his daughter, Heatherflower. 
The land was subsequently transferred, either sold or given, by Gardiner to Smith in 1663. As for Whisper, it's not likely that Smith named his animals, and it is more generally believed a local contest among students led to the naming. One bird that has certainly gotten around Long Island is this 40-foot heron. I used to enjoy seeing it on the dock at Port Jefferson by Danford's Inn on Suffolk's North Shore. Then one day the sculpture, created by artist Roberto Besson in 1988, simply disappeared. It turns out this piece has had several roosts, from the artist Centerport home to New York Harbor. It even floated on a barge as part of Besson's Heron on the Hudson project in 1992. Businessman James Miller, after obtaining what he believed to be the necessary approvals, bought and dedicated the heron as a monument to Peconic Bay. Then he planted it on the shoreline of his beachfront property in Southold. Neighbors didn't approve, though, and the two-ton bird became what is believed to be the first piece of art in history to be declared a building that required a permit. It was exiled to Greenport while the courts battled it out, with Miller eventually winning the right to display it on his property in 2002. A decade later, Miller became one of the principal owners of the former Teachers Federal Credit Union headquarters on North Ocean Avenue in Farmingville, and the heron flew his South Hold coop. It's a piece of artwork that is very beautiful, and I want to share it with everybody, Miller said of the sculpture and its move to the site, which has since been renamed the Heron Professional Center. Now I can again enjoy seeing the stately bird looking skyward. It's been called Hell House, the Satan House, the Witch House, the Long Island Grimpendium, or conversely, the Cafaro Castle. Whatever you call it, this Massapequa home in Nassau County definitely stands out from its neighbors on Daniel Road. The architectural details are amazing and rely heavily on symmetry. Some contend the window layout resembles a demonic grin. Dozens of legends have circulated for decades about the private home, which may or may not actually be haunted. One has it that candles suddenly illuminate in windows when cars come by the house. Coincidentally, the number of candles in the window corresponds to the number of people in the car. Another holds that a ghostly figure with long black hair, dressed in a black robe, can be seen looking out of the windows. Despite the eerie atmosphere with tilted headstone-like pillars, iron-spiked gates, and a blood-red driveway, people who claim to know the owners say, ah, they're eccentric, nothing more. The Serenity Garden, constructed by the Plainview Old Bethpage Chamber of Commerce in 2010, replaced a garbage-strewn corner in Nassau County. Now their horse of a different color, clad in oversized sneakers, stands guard and ensures the peaceful spot is a welcoming center of relaxation near Plainview Hospital. The project was a true community effort. Benches were donated by the hospital's administration and the local Lions Club. The Plainview Water District makes sure it stays watered and the checkered statue is the work of artist Brian Strumwasser, a student at the time in the Plainview High School Art Department. This is an odd type of memorial on the corner of Old Country and Lewis Roads in East Quag. It marks the spot where more than a hundred years ago a tree stood. Not just any tree, a mighty white oak with a hole in its trunk. For locals in the late 1700s, it provided a lifeline of sorts. When Long Island post riders began regular service from New York City to Greenport in 1765, the tree served as a community mailbox. Initially, the hole was a drop-off and pickup point for the mail. Later, an actual box was installed, reportedly making it the first known letterbox in North America. The so-called box tree was damaged by fire in 19, 1894, but it lives on still. A fragment of the old tree is on display at the Old Schoolhouse Museum in this Suffolk town. In a day when far wind farms are cropping up as an alternative energy source, it might come as a surprise that the island is simply returning to its roots. Since as early as 1644, windmills have been a prominent part of the local landscape. 
Without suitable streams for water power, wind energy was used back in the day to power grist mills, grinding out wheat, corn, and rye, and even logs into lumber. This one, known as the Pantigo Windmill in East Hampton, is one of the of only 11 surviving 18th and early 19th century wind-powered grist mills on Long Island. Its name comes from its seven-decade residence on a road of the same name, before it was moved to its current spot on James Lane in Suffolk. You wouldn't be the first person to do a double-take driving on Spring Road in Huntington. After all, it's not every house that sports a full family of bright green dinosaurs carrying a red lantern. There's a veritable zoo of fish, dinosaurs, and my favorite, a penguin, roaming the premises on the border of Nassau and Suffolk. The first dinosaur was made in the 1970s by a local mason from chicken wire and later cemented over and painted green and put on his brother's land. The menagerie expanded over time and has become something of a local landmark. The first ship to be launched from the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1820 was the USS Ohio, a remnant of which is installed in Suffolk County. The ship's figurehead and anchor are housed in an open-air pavilion by the shore in Stony Brook. There, this massive, colorful bust of Hercules looks away from the water toward the village's quaint shopping plaza. The lion spread across his shoulders was not representative of a favorite pet, as you might think by the apparently contented look on his face. Rather, it is supposed to be the skin of a lion he'd killed with his bare hands. Also within the shelter is the Polaris whaleboat, believed to be the only surviving artifact from a failed polar expedition expedition in 1870. It was recovered by Commander Robert Perry in 1905 and eventually made its way to Stony Brook. A familiar sight for anyone traveling east on Old Country Road or Route 58 in Riverhead is the Raceway Indian known as Chief Running Fair. The Chief was bought by racetrack officials back in 1982 when Connecticut's Danbury Fair, that had featured several oversized fiberglass statues, closed and the figures were sold at auction. He is part of a series, according to RoadsideAmerica.com, which hosts a website of oddities in the U.S. They dubbed the larger-than-life images as muffler men because many served as marketing tools and held big car mufflers in their posed hands, all using the same mold as the original, which was a steely-eyed Paul Bunyan with his axe. The mold, mold was altered for the Big Chief series. The most notable changes were made to the arms, with one raised in greeting. These were built by California-based fiberglass companies in the late 1960s, and today hundreds of the 14 to 25 foot tall giants posed as gas station attendants, lumberjacks, cowboys, Indians, etc., can still be spied along highways across the country, including here in Suffolk. Similar in stature, but not considered a muffler man, is Big Chief Lewis in Massapequa. He was installed in 1968 next to the Lewis office building off Sunrise Highway the one-time home of a Nassau realtor who promoted himself as Big Chief R.J. Lewis. Supposedly, the Native American tableau stands as a tribute to American Indian history on Long Island, which gave rise to local place names. By the year 1643, there were 13 different Indian tribes documented as living on Long Island, including the Massapequas. The Big Chief is one of many oversized fiberglass and steel roadside statues created by Rodman Shute of Pennsylvania. He designed each piece individually, which he sold and shipped nationwide. Several of the giants were representative of Native Americans, but he also created figures for the Pennsylvania Fun Park, Dutch Wonderland, and the 15-foot-tall Amos at the Hershey Farm Restaurant and Inn. The totem pole behind Big Chief is believed to be a lucky talisman, for those who can reach behind the chain link fence and touch it. Soldiers of a very special kind have been memorialized at the H. Lee Denison's Suffolk County Office Complex in Hapog. The War Dog Monument is dedicated to all the canine soldiers who served in every branch of the military, from the Revolutionary War 
to present day, whether on the battlefield or as members of search and rescue teams. The sculptor modeled this 2005 bronze memorial on Tsunami, a female black German shepherd, and posed her to appear ready to step into the unknown danger ahead. She was one of more than 300 dogs who went into ground zero for search and rescue. An inscription notes these dogs don't just go into harm's way, but also provide their fellow humans a thought of home during times of turmoil. With the spectacular 130,000 square foot Cradle of Aviation Museum garnering attention of aerospace fans in Garden City, Nassau County, some people may stop and scratch their heads at sighting a simple sculpture roughly a mile and a half north of the museum on a street corner in Westbury. That's where the spirit of St. Louis Memorial stands to mark Charles Lindbergh's actual takeoff point from the strip known in 1927 as Roosevelt Airfield. The young pilot was on a quest to win a $25,000 prize for the first non-stop flight from New York to Paris. New York City stonemason Chris Pelletieri created the 10-foot wide granite sculpture, which depicts Lindbergh's custom-built, single-engine, single-seat, high-wing monoplane at the very moment it lifted off for Paris. The original runway is long gone, and the marker stands unceremoniously between two light poles at a back entrance to the parking lot of the Source Mall. The monument was funded by Alan Fortunoff, former owner of the adjoining shopping mall, and designated a Town of Hempstead landmark in 2013. Running through the tunnel from parking lot to shore, few, if any, beachgoers at the Smith Point County Park in Mastic Beach give more than a passing glance to the array of flags billowing in a sea breeze. Especially younger ones might view them as just a colorful backdrop amid the dunes at the Fire Island barrier beach of the Atlantic Ocean. They don't realize the tragedy those flags reflect. They identify the 14 countries from which 230 flyers aboard the ill-fated TWA Flight 800 called home. On July 17, 1996, news ricocheted around Long Island of the mid-air explosion off the south coast of Suffolk County, just 12 minutes from takeoff from JFK Airport. This hit home with one of my family members who had a friend on the flight headed for Paris, France. Initially, witnesses reported some type of fireball lighting up the late summertime sky, and rumors spread that there was a surface-to-air missile launched at it. However, the National Transportation and Safety Board, after a four-year investigation, considered aviation history's longest, most complicated and expensive, costing an estimated $40 million, determined it was not an act of ter terrorism of any kind, but more likely a fuel tank explosion due to faulty wiring issues in the center tank. The dramatic memorial project that includes, along with the flags, a huge granite curved wall that was built by volunteers from local union carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. The Smith Point site was selected because it is the closest shore point to the crash site that was 10 miles south of the inlet. One side of the granite wall carries the names of all victims, while the other is an etched sea site with a flock of seagulls flying offshore. 2021 marks the 25th anniversary of the tragedy, and as they do each year, family and friends of the travelers will gather to remember them. They will also celebrate the final demise of the plane's remnants. The debris had been stored for ongoing research, which has led to significant changes in safety recommendations and aircraft design. The NTSB, though, had promised family members that the wreckage would be destroyed and so never become an exhibit or public display. Stopping by this memorial, be sure to read the engraved plaque with its interesting wording that gives a nod to those who never fully accepted the NTSB's findings. A parking fee is charged for the beach lot from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Memorial Day to Labor Day, but outside of those times, parking is free. At the eastbound on-ramp to the Long Island Expressway in Yapank, you come to the end of the South Service Road of Exit 67. 
which is also where many young orphans came to the end of their sad road too. A simple wooden archway marks the entrance to the Suffolk County Almshouse Cemetery, filled with little headstone markers, barely a foot high and about eight inches wide, bearing numbers, not names, for the roughly 1,000 souls buried there. Some of these young residents were aged 2 to 16 and came from the nearby county children's home or orphanage. For nearly 100 years, Suffolk County buried unclaimed bodies of those children, as well as other unclaimed deceased from the area. Some from the Alms House, which was run for the county's indigent and homeless, as well as some from the nearby jail. A kiosk at the edge of the cemetery lists the names of all those interred from 1871 to 1953. Some have the simple annotation colored next to their name, date of death, age, and marker number. The mixed races of interred listed as white, colored, or copper for Native American makes this graveyard perhaps the earliest interracial one in Suffolk. Up until laws changed in New York in 1938, residents of the Elms House would work the farm behind it, part of a 170-acre plot purchased by the county in 1870. It is now operated by the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Sometimes you don't have to go very far to find things that get you asking, what's up with that? What comes to my mind is street names. Some are pretty colorful, and others, you just know there's a story behind it. From Suffolk County, we have several entries for this category. Take one in my hometown, Granny Road in Farmingville. As the story goes, it is named for Esther Granny Penny, born in 1734. According to the local historical society, she was a very well-known doctress who rode a fast horse and always wore a red cape, probably made from the wool of her own sheep. From Coram to Yapank, she tended to the sick, reduced fevers, delivered babies, and mended broken bones. She created medicines from herbs she grew in her own garden. She died in 1837 at a very ripe old age for the time, 103. Indian Head Road in Smithtown has an intriguing legend attached to it. There was a stone the Nassaquik people believed resembled an Indian's head that protected the natives walking on a nearby path. The story is that if, there were, if it were ever removed, as did occasionally happen, it would find its way back and resume its vigil. After the Indians had left the region, though, the stone vanished, leaving behind only the street name. Running east-west through Ridge, Whiskey Road owes its name to an unusual incentive used in the late 1700s to clear a path through the woods for a love-struck farmer so he could have a straight run to his sweetheart a few miles away. Records at the local high school contend the landowner used a jug of whiskey to keep his workers toiling along. The jug was placed a short distance ahead of the men, who could stop and take a swig when the trail was cleared to it. Then it was moved forward again with the same promise. The jug wasn't always moved in a due west fashion, though, possibly due to the amount of whiskey consumed. The trail ended up being somewhat crooked, with the added reputation of being one of the most twisty roads in the town of Brookhaven. Whooping Hollow Road in East Hampton has a sort of choose-your-own ending tale to it. Several versions for the street name's origin start out the same. A young boy is heard screaming his way along the path as he was pursued by Indians one night in the early 1700s. One tale has it that he was caught, savagely beaten, and killed. A kinder, gentler story holds that he had whooped and screamed for help so loudly as he ran that the Indians gave up the chase. The town of Huntington's Mount Misery Road has an ominous connotation, as the name suggests. Unlike Sag Harbor's Mount Misery Drive, that was named because the land was hilly and hard to work, making it miserable to trek over. The street in West Hills County Park, however, on the border between Nassau and Suffolk counties, has a much more sinister association. According to the town of Huntington, there are countless local legends about ghosts and spirits haunting the woods of Mount Misery one of the highest peaks of Long Island at around 400 feet. Dating back to Native Americans and the first settlers, 
Stories and visions detail fantastic creatures and strange lights in the skies over these woods. The most famous of these tales is that of Hatchet Mary, a young woman who is said to have murdered a family with a hatchet and then to have taken her own life. According to the legend, following the gruesome murders, her house sank into the ground, leaving nothing but the chimney. Hatchet Mary's ghost is said to still haunt these woods today. Nassau County has its fair share of odd names. Skunk's Misery Road takes its name from a swamp in what is now the Locust Valley area. Early settlers had used it as a dump. The composting pile served as an outdoor dining hall for a pack of skunks that foraged in the refuse. The odor was said to be so bad that people wondered how even the skunks could tolerate it. Near where I lived in Nassau County was Shelter Rock Road, with its outsized erratic, that's a boulder left behind from the Ice Age. It is considered Long Island's biggest, weighing in at an estimated 5 million pounds, with a huge overhead ledge. It is believed the granite rock's 30-foot overhang sheltered local Indians as far back as 1000 BC, and later settlers who used the rock along a cow path for protection for their cattle during the severe storms. In nearby Glenhead, we come to Mutton Town Road, an odd choice for a street name in an elite Gold Coast neighborhood. But back in colonial times, sheep farmers would drive their livestock through this area to the slaughterhouse, where the meat produced would be called mutton. If you're driving through some plush North Shore towns associated with the elite Gold Coast era, you have probably seen signs indicating that a road is private. Actually, these are usually not real roads but rather very long driveways the owners don't want you accidentally tooling along. In Yapank and Suffolk, however, there is a regular road that is actually called private. Really driving home the message that outsiders need not venture into this little community, once known as Camp Siegfried and German Gardens, where flower gardens were shaped as swastikas and children reportedly came from all over New York State to learn camping, hunting, shooting skills, as well as eugenics, or how to expand the Aryan race. Streets in the 50-acre complex that had a camp along Upper Yapank Lake, as well as a 50-home community, carried the names of Nazi leaders when it was first developed in the 1930s. A dedicated train brought people to the enclave from Penn Station. When the Long Island Railroad Camp Siegfried Special rolled to a stop some 65 miles east of New York City, the more than 150 campers were greeted by uniformed marchers and Heil Hitler salutes. By 1941, though, the FBI took a closer look at the community and closed it down, sending many of the Nazi sympathizers to the nearby Camp Upton stockade. The camp property was folded into the town of Yapank and became Siegfried Park. The Nazi flags came down and street names were changed. Adolf Hitler Strasse became Park Street. Goering was turned into Oak Street and Goebbels Northside Avenue. The one-time parade ground was converted to a community park. But some practices and policies of the original facility, under the auspices of the German-American Settlement League, which still owned the land, but not the houses on it, persisted. Chief among these was restricting house ownership to white people of German descent which came to light when a couple attempted to sell their home in 2015. Eventually, the state got involved and a lawsuit was settled a few years later that prohibited the discriminatory practices. Even the original entry sign declaring the German-American Settlement League community private with access limited to members and guests only is gone and replaced with a simpler green one, eliminating mention of the league altogether and noting only a private community. According to a report in the Wall Street Journal, the League has since declared it has moved on from that racist past and into the 21st century. Driving past the quiet, nondescript entryway today, few would guess the hub of activity that once happened here, when up to 40,000 loyal followers arrived one August day in 1938 to celebrate at the Nazi camp, and a legend grew that Adolf Hitler himself had once popped in to inspect how his camp was progressed. And here's a site you would not expect to see on a road in suburban Nassau County, much less on the grounds of the old Bethpage Village Restoration, 
That's an open-air living history museum depicting 19th century Long Island. But that's where you could spy wartime Sherman and Tiger One tanks rolling along. They are all part of the 25,000 square foot Museum of American Armor, where more than 30 types of armor, even a Nike surface-to-air missile, howitzer gun, and a classic LaSalle staff car, all used during the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and or the Gulf War, are on display. During some events, living historians offer demonstrations of World War II tactics and explain the role of American GIs over the last 50 years. Opened in 2014, the museum's focus is said to be to reconnect a new generation of Americans with the courage, valor, and sacrifice of those who have defended our nation. For a real juxtaposition of errors, take the steps up a hill overlooking the museum and you jump into a late 19th and early 20th century Main Street and the Long Island-based Gold Coast Studio set, one of the filming locations for the new HBO series called The Gilded Age. Layers of green screen give away the fact that this is a movie set, with the bright green later transformed by computer wizardry to fill in any number of background effects. Production was just getting underway on the series, a brainchild of Downton Abbey creator Julian Fellows, when COVID-19 hit and the stage became a real ghost town. Production resumed in February 2021, and the show is expected to air later in the year, starring such luminaries as Christine Baranski and Cynthia Nixon, and featuring a who's who of guest stars, including Nathan Lane and Audra McDonald, who will roam the gaslit streets, elegant stairways, and private gardens of upscale New York, reconstructed on a lot off Round Swamp Road in Plainview. The latest question mark to pop up on Long Island is currently at the Suffolk County William H. Rogers Legislature Building in Smithtown. It's a simple but profound memorial dedicated to the people of Suffolk who lost their lives to the COVID-19 virus. Originally this and a sister version at the Evans K. Griffin Building in Riverhead were to be only temporary commemoratives exhibited during March 2021, marking one year after the first coronavirus case was confirmed in New York State. But then plans changed, and the two will ultimately be joined and put on permanent display down the road at the H. Lee Denison Building. The simple design, reminiscent of a rustic fence post, was constructed by Boy Scout Troop 888 and is meant to be easily expanded to accommodate at least 3,000 ribbons, the number of Suffolk COVID deaths at the time it was built. The memorial is displayed in the building lobby or outdoors when the weather is suitable and has a box with supplies, including pens and royal blue ribbons next to it. According to a county representative, the idea is that someone could simply drive up and place a ribbon on the memorial in a socially distant manner. Residents can also go to the county website where they could upload the deceased's name, date of death, and even share a memory, as well as a photo. If they cannot get to the memorial themselves, the county will add the name inscribed ribbon for them. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to it too, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope you've enjoyed your journey around Long Island and perhaps had some insights into these roadside sites. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see any of my European destinations. When libraries are again offering in-person programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. And the next time you are tooling around, keep your eyes peeled for more sites that prompt you to ask, hey, what's up with that?